Once again, I wish you happy Sabbath and welcome to our BUC service. We keep going, even though there's an easing down on the lockdown, we know that our churches are still closed. And so we have this wonderful opportunity to remain connected via the YouTube channel and our Facebook services. So we welcome you this Sabbath day. We have a number of activities taking place today and we have a full service and um, we have Pastor Halsey Pete, who will be our speaker later on today. He is the assistant to the president in the Ontario Conference in Canada. We also have a message from our BUC president as well and a number of musical items on the way. But as usual, we're going to join Pastor Derek Morris for our Hope Sabbath School. Welcome to Hope Sabbath School, an in-depth, interactive study of the Word of God. We are in the middle of an amazing series on how to interpret the Bible. Today we're talking about language, text, and context. Some practical tools that can help us when we come to interpret the Bible. I know you'll be blessed. By the way, if you've missed anything in this important series, go to our website, hopetv.org slash hopess. You can look at all of the previous programs. You can even look at other series when you're there at our website. Download the outline that we use. You can even start your own interactive Bible study in your community. It's exciting to see what God is doing around the world. We've even got some other Bible resources for you. If you go to hopebiblestudy.org, we want you to be just filled with the Word of God. Most of all, so that you can be connected to the living Word of God, right? Amen. 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 Connected with Jesus. That's what this series is all about. Mm -hmm. We're glad you're with us and welcome to the team. And we're studying today about language, text, and context. It sounds complicated, but we'll find some simple tools that will help us in our study. Father in heaven, we know that you want us to understand your Word. And most of all, you want us to know Jesus, the living Word of God our Savior and Lord and soon coming King. And so I pray you promise the Holy Spirit will lead us into truth. And I pray that as we study here on our Hope Sabbath School today, that you'd lead us into truth that would not only bless our lives, but through us bless the lives of those around us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Understanding the scriptures. We're going to talk about some tools for language, text, and context. I want to make it simple so that someone like Rudy, I forget how old Rudy was. I think he was nine, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah so Rudy can, so I can do that. I can look up and see what a word means. I can look up a city in the Bible dictionary and see where it's found. I can look at the words around, the verses around, what we call the context to help mm -hmm. understand. And, and maybe someone who's 82, like George, who wrote to us recently, can say, that's helped me to understand the Bible like never before. So let's get into the journey together and start in a passage that the Spirit's been leading us back to over and over again in this series, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. I memorized this one as one of my wife's scripture songs, all scripture is, I'm not going to sing it to you though, it's given by inspiration of God. But Stephanie, if you could read it, there's one clear message, lots of things included in here, but one overarching message about us and the Bible, which I want you to grasp. And I'll be reading from the King James Version. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So what's the overarching message of that text? Mm -hmm. Well, if Scripture is going to be profitable for a variety of things, that means we can... Understood. Yeah, so in some sense, oh, don't even read the Bible. You won't be able to understand it. Just do whatever the religious leader tells you to do. Mm -hmm. Say, no, no, no. It says that I can... It's going to be profitable for me. Yeah. I can understand it. Does that make right. sense? Yes. yes. In fact, read for us Revelation chapter 1, 
in verse 3. And there's a very mm -hmm. simple promise as we begin the book of Revelation that I find very encouraging. Because would you agree with me that Revelation is not an easy book? Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Not an easy book, Haiti. Verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 3, what promise is given to those who read that? And I would say without, I think, doing violence to the text, that that promise applies to the whole Bible. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Let's see yeah. what it says. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, and it says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Blessed is the one who reads. That would be the, I guess, the teacher, right? Mm -hmm. On a previous study, Brittany said, the more I shared with others about the Bible, the deeper my own understanding. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. But also, blessed are those who hear. 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 But that means, if we're blessed, it means what? We're understanding it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, we talked in a previous study about the fact that maybe like in Nehemiah's time, we not only read the scripture, but we also give the, the sense was how it was translated, or the yeah. meaning. We, we help to interpret it. But it is possible to understand mm -hmm. what the scriptures are saying. Mm -hmm. So how can I learn to, uh, to come to the scriptures with a greater expectation? Maybe I've... Uh, Maybe there's someone watching Hope Sabbath School today and they, they say, you know, I've tried. I just don't understand it. Mm -hmm. How can I come with a greater anticipation, Sabina, that I'll actually be able to, to understand what God's wanting to tell me? Yeah, I think it's important to know that there is always fresh and new revelation that will come from God in the Bible. So if you pray and seek Him earnestly, even if you take some time, progressively revelation will come to you. So just keep Keep going, keep searching, and you will learn more and more. There was a key point that Sabina made, and that was just what? Pray. 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 Yeah. That's right. Now, when I pray, let's say Susan prays, and Susan says, God, I just want to understand more. Guide me. She may get a phone call from Evelyn saying, do you want to study the Bible? Mm -hmm. Or John may get a, a call from Gary or invited to church by Christian, right? God may answer that prayer in a variety of ways. Or... As we heard here, I told my friend about Hope Sabbath School, mm -hmm. right? So there's different ways that God can answer that prayer. But uh, if a person says, I don't know, I, I can really get that. The blessing is there. Mm -hmm. Stephanie? I just remember when I was started studying the Bible that it wasn't all that interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And I think it was because of the things that I was feasting upon outside of the Word of God. Okay. So when I came to the Word of God, it, it was a little dry. Mm -hmm. But when I realized that this, this became my food and not b other books that were not drawing me to Jesus, it changed the way I viewed the Bible. Maybe when I'm praying, God may tell me to let go of some distractions mm -hmm. uh, that, that are getting in the way. Yeah. Thomas? I relate a lot to that because when I started reading the Bible, like has been said before, you know, the beginning, especially the early chapters, mm -hmm. you know, it, you, it, it is a bit dry if you're not, if you don't really know how to get the, the meat out of it. And so for me, studying with a community of believers was very helpful for me because they taught me how to see the spiritual truth in it. Mm -hmm. So that's an important point. The blessing is there. We can understand yes. it. Even though we might not understand everything, it's a growth, a journey, and being in a community can help us. Mm -hmm. But we're going to look at some ways, some tools, if you will, that will help us as we're studying and interpreting the Bible. And one is to understand key words. Mm -hmm. I may read a text and there's a key word there, and I go, I need to understand what that word means. I may read the word in English, propitiation. <laughs> I say, what is that? Or justification. I thought that was something we did on the paper to make the words line up. You want full justification or left justification, right? Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I know that word. But, but in the Bible, justification, if I look it up, means what? Justice. What does it mean? Being made right. Yeah. It means being made right with God. Being made yeah. right with God. So I might want to look that word up uh, and, and see what it means. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Let's look at a few key words that we find often in the Bible. One is the word 
mercy, mm. mercy. Uh, translated in different ways in the Hebrew, chesed. I can mm. hardly say it, chesed. Mm. Uh, but let's look at a few places uh, where it's uh, used. Psalm 57 and verse 3. Jason, could you read that for us? Here's the psalmist David. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Psalm chapter 57, verse 3. He shall send from heaven and save me. He reproaches the one who would swallow me up. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. Does anyone have another translation in your Bible? God shall send forth his mercy. Nicole, God shall... Send forth his love and his faithfulness. His love and faithfulness. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have another? What does it say in your Portuguese Bible, Sabina? God um, chose... It's the same. How would you translate it? Love and faithfulness. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is a very rich word. Some have translated it covenant loyalty. Mm. Uh, chesed. God keeps his promises. Yes. It's a rich word. I ought to... You know, mercy, you say, mercy, mercy. And think mm -hmm. mercy means, you know, oh, someone's trying to hurt me. Mm -hmm. I need to understand, if I'm looking at a passage, what a key word means. Mm -hmm. Look in Psalm 66. Nicole, could you read verse 20 sure. of Psalm 66? The New International Version says, Praise be to God, who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. Uh, yours says his love. Anyone else? Another translation? Mercy. 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 His mercy from me, okay? Let's look in Psalm 143. This is another of my wife's scripture songs. Cause me to hear something in the morning. Haiti, could you read for us Psalm 143 and verse 8? Yes. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, and it says, Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. How do we hear God's loving kindness? Mm. Mm. What does that mean? How do I hear it? Travis? Through his promises. Okay, so maybe yeah. coming back to his word, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You keep telling me that if I get in the word, I'm going to hear about a God who loves me, That's right? Mm -hmm. With an immeasurable and unfailing love. Mm -hmm. Help me to hear that, God. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. So this word, which some translate mercy, or it's rich, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. What have we heard? Love, loving kindness, unfailing faithfulness, love. unfailing love, mercy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When we're studying the Bible, if we come across a key word, let's study into it a little more and look at other places. Mm -hmm. How do I find out other places where that same word is used? Mm -hmm. What do I use? Concordance. A concordance. Use a concordance. Thank you, Thomas. Mm -hmm. I use a concordance, which will show me the word and it says chesed, it will tell me that word, and it will show me all the places where it's found. I can look it up, especially with the same author. I'm seeing used in a variety of ways, Pedro. It is interesting to notice that the concordance help us to see that word in the original language. Yes. Sometimes you can look for a word, like there's a, if you look in the Bible, there's works and deeds. But they, some translations use the word works in the same ways as deeds. Uh, but there are different words in a sense. So we have to know the original uh, and connect them to the right uh, a context. A big example of that we're going to come to later is the word love, where, mm -hmm. where it can be different mm -hmm. words of kind of a brotherly love or agape love. You know? mm -hmm. And we just use the word love. Mm -hmm. right. But uh, in the text, it may show a deeper word. Mm -hmm. Here's another one, peace. Mm -hmm. in, in Hebrew, shalom. Mm -hmm. It means more than just peace, you know, like, the absence of war. It means well-being, wholeness. Mm -hmm. Let's look at a few examples where this word is used. You, you see a key word. We're talking about how to interpret the Bible. Gary, could you read the blessing? Aaron said this is how you're to bless the people. Numbers chapter 6. Uh -huh. The Lord bless you and keep you. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Have you heard that? Yes. In Numbers 6, verses 24 through 26. Okay, I'll be reading from the New King James Version. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Mm. Peace. Mm. Absence of war? Mm -hmm. Could you have shalom in the midst of war? Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Doesn't the Bible say in another place, you will keep her in perfect peace, mm -hmm. mind whose is mind is stayed, stayed, stayed on mm -hmm. you because she trusts in you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's an inner state of wholeness and mm -hmm. wellness, mm -hmm. inner peace. Let's uh, look at Psalm 29 and verse 11. Again, as Thomas pointed out, I can use the concordance. I can find many places where this word uh, shalom is used. Psalm 29. Nancy, would you read verse 11 for us? Yes, from the New King James Version. The Lord will give strength to His people. The Lord will bless His people with peace. Bless them with shalom. Bless them with peace. And then, of course, because as we've been reminded, it's all pointing to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Isaiah the prophet tells us, Christian, could you read Isaiah 9 and verse 6? Someone says, if you don't know the answer to the question, just say Jesus, <laughs> right? Because he's the center, right? What does it say? Uh, we're talking about this word shalom. Shalom. In, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, and I'll be re reading from the New King James Version. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Prince of Shalom. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's a beautiful picture. While we're there, Evelyn, in Isaiah, could you go to chapter 26? I, I quoted one verse, but I'd like you to read verses 3 and 4. You know, I find it exciting to study the Bible when you find a key word like that mm -hmm. and you look at other places where that word is used. You see a richness that's mm -hmm. just, and the Holy Spirit guides you in that. Is it Isaiah 3, 22, 3 and 4? 26. Oh, 26. Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4. All right, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Mm. Trust in the Lord forever, for in Yah, the Lord, is everlasting strength. You keep him or her in perfect mm. peace. Trust in the Lord, what? Forever. For in Yah, that's a contraction of Yahweh, mm. the name of the Lord. In Yah, the Lord is everlasting strength. <laughs> yes. What a beautiful promise. So I could take many words like uh, mercy or peace or grace. Let's look at love, mm. specifically agape, agape love. Scholars tell me that the word agape, the noun and the, mm. the verb agapao, was seldom used mm. in, in mm. classical Greek. Mm. It's, like, it's like the early Christians grab it and make it their own. Mm. Mm. And they invest in it special meaning. Mm. Let's see where they use it, and that will help us to understand. Travis, John chapter 3 and verse 16, we find this, uh, this agape love mentioned. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's emphasize the first three words for, for uh, four words, excuse for me. God so love. For God so, for God so love. love. The verb is agapao, the noun agape. God so loved the world. Go to 1 John, same author in his letter, 1 John chapter 1, excuse me, chapter 3, verse 1. Thomas, do you have 1 John chapter uh, 3? And verse 1. These short letters right before the book of Revelation. Yes. First John? Yes, First John chapter, chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse, verse 1. 1. I love this verse. This is from New King James Version. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Mm. Behold, what manner of agape mm. love self-sacrificing love and, and you want to know how connected God is to that self-sacrificing love Sabina what does it say in that same little book first John chapter 4 and verse 8 4 verse 8 I'll be reading from the uh, New International Version whoever does not love does not know God because God is love 
God is agape. Mm. He is self-sacrificing love. So I could take that concordance, whether I think, uh, Stephanie, in a previous program, you said you had a Strong's concordance, mm -hmm. and there's a Young's concordance, <laughs> and there, there was a, a Cruden's concordance. Now there's all kinds of digital concordances, right? All they do is help you to find the other places where that same word is used. And one more, if we can, and that is in same First John chapter four, verses eighteen and nineteen. First John chapter four. Pedro, could you read verses eighteen and nineteen for us? Yes, First John four, eighteen and nineteen. It says, "There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love." We love him because he first loved us. Mm. Now, someone might say, and Tom, I'll come to your point. Some might say, but Derek, I don't have enough of that love. Well, agape love is not worked up. Mm. It's not bought somewhere. How does agape love fill our hearts? Does anybody remember a Bible text? You'd find it, Christian. Yeah, if you... Romans yeah. chapter 5. Should we find it? Yeah. Give us a moment there. Yeah. Romans, the Holy Spirit just said, go to Romans chapter 5. It's not in our outline. But Romans chapter 5, is it verse 5? Verse 5, yes. Give us a moment to find it because this is really good news. Someone says, Christian, I don't think I've got enough of that love in my heart. And God wants me to be filled with his agape love. I've been doing this word study. What does it tell us in Romans 5 and verse 5? Yes, and I'll read from the New King James Version. Uh, Paul wrote, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Mm. Ah, the love of God is what? Mm. Poured, out. Poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Mm. Holy Spirit, fill my life today. Mm. Fill me Amen. with the agape love of God. Now, you could just do a word study. We're talking about how to interpret the Bible. Just have the concordance and look at every place you find agape. And you would be amazed and you would learn God is love. He loves the world, not just a few people. He wants us. Isn't there a new commandment that you love? Mm -hmm. Would you like to guess what word that is in the Greek? Mm -hmm. Yes, agape. Agapao, the verb. You love one another as I have loved you. We're going to talk about how sometimes when we're interpreting, words are repeated to emphasize how important it is. Yeah. Thomas? Correct me if I'm wrong, but the classic text that is used in weddings is 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13, which is also about agape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, yes. But the, uh, the, the way it's also translated in some other passages is charity. And charity, right, which today, uh, when we, at least I grew up in the UK, uh, charity was like um, helping the poor. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, does charity, what does that mean now? So that's why sometimes we talked in a previous study about finding a, a translation that uses language right. that is intelligible. Obviously, if you don't speak English, it should be in Portuguese or it should be in Tamil or it should be in, you know, name another language, right? But, uh, but also sometimes language can get old. Yeah. And when I say you need charity, someone says, no, I've actually <laughs> I've, I've paid my right. bills and... What we're actually saying is you need the agape love of God, right? And it also reminds us that a part of that love is grace. And how many families today could probably use a little more grace? Amen. Mm -hmm. But we can't get that without God's love. Without God's love. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, our time is flying by, but I'm going to ask you just randomly if you would share with me a, a word in Scripture that has become very precious to you. Just, just share a few, Christian. Uh, the word wise. Wise or wisdom. Wisdom, yes. All right, that's, mm -hmm. that's totally embedded mm. in the book of Proverbs, but other yeah. places too. Mm -hmm. uh, he wants us to be wise. And by the way, reverence for God is the beginning of mm -hmm. wisdom, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. well, another word, and you could take this, do a word study on it. Nicole? Joy. 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 Ah, I, I write these things to you that your joy may be full. And, and the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy. joy, right. So you can find all the places where joy are mentioned, right? Yeah. Beautiful. Another one. Um, uh, patience. Patience. Mm. Love is patience. patience. That's back to 1 yeah. Corinthians 13. And one of the fruits of the Spirit is patience, patience okay? Yeah. Endurance. Uh, another one. 
Yes, Stephanie. Grace. Grace. Uh, for by grace you've been saved. Grace to you and peace. That's shalom, by the way. Sabina. I also like listen, and because in the old Hebrew, it, also, it doesn't mean just listen passively, but also actively. Ah, it's actively like a, listen. Actively listening. It's actively is, listen. You need to engage also with actions and not just to receive information. Oh, okay, so listen with, with the resulting action. Yes. Mm. yes. I, I love the, in Proverbs 19, Shema. listen to counsel, receive instruction that you may be wise. 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 <laughs> so when we're talking about Bibles, how to study the Bible, we can find these key words yeah. and we can go on an adventure, <laughs> right? Yeah. And the Holy Spirit can show us the richness. Say, God, I need more joy. I'm going to look every place where it talks about joy, yeah. you know, and, 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 uh, you know, I think the joy of the Lord, Nehemiah, strength. is your strength. Mm -hmm. You say, well, I don't have the joy. It's okay. The joy of the <laughs> Lord <laughs> is your strength. Mm. When we get into studying, we'll find sometimes that a word is repeated. You say, why do they keep repeating that same word? Let's look at a couple of examples. Uh, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27 is an example where, where we've got repetition. We'd like to read that, Nicole. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Uh, the New International Version says, <clears throat> Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So what word do you hear repeated? Several words, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. what, what words are repeated there? Image. God. Image, all right? Mm -hmm. Now you say, well, I think I need to understand what that means. Maybe I'll try to find some other places where that word is used and look it up. What other words repeated? God. Created. Created. God. 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 Our. 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 <laughs> our. So, you know, you look at that and you say, okay, there's something significant. Mm -hmm. I notice a repetition. Mm -hmm. Let's look at another example of that in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3. Isaiah 6. I'm not answering all of our study questions here. I'm just showing us we find a key word, we can explore it. Mm -hmm. We find repetition, we ask why. Okay, mm -hmm. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3. Evelyn, could you read that for us? I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy? Why doesn't it just say, Holy is the <clears throat> Lord God of hosts? Would that be good? <clears throat> Would that be good? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It would be true, right? Holy, holy yeah. is, you know, be holy <laughs> for I am holy. Yeah. It, the Lord doesn't say be holy for I am holy, holy, holy. <laughs> says it one time, right? But here is holy, holy, holy. <laughs> I see a couple of heads. Why do you think the repetition? Well, uh, in, the, in the passage we just read uh, a minute ago in Genesis, let us make man in our image. Um, I see here in Isaiah that the, the Godhead is being recognized. Mm -hmm. That's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So you think it's not just a coincidental coincidence. Just, mm -hmm. Let's just say holy a few more times. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, anybody want to add to that? Do you, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah, I know. Uh, by the way, back to a comment uh, Thomas made in a previous study. I don't want to base a whole theology on one verse, yeah. right? Uh, but, but if it's born out, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If there's many places that speak about the Father, love of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all, you know, there's evidence for what's being said. Could it just be holy, 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 emphasis, emphasis, emphasis. like he's really holy? Mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. Holy, holy beyond holy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, for sure. I, I think there's probably something to what Christian is saying. Though. All right, but a repetition, mm -hmm. Stephanie? Well, I think of Revelation 4, chapter 4, verse 8 where the angels are saying, holy, 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 who was and is and is to come. Mm. Mm -hmm. He was holy, he is holy, and he will be holy. Mm. But could it also be a reference to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit yes. there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not holy, 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 holy. <laughs> so 
I find a repetition and I say, apparently there's something significant I need mm -hmm. to think about, right? Mm -hmm. Let's go to John chapter 13. I think Christian found something else, but we have to keep moving. <laughs> we don't have time. Yeah, yeah, John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Jason, if you could read that. There is one word that is just repeated over and over again. Mm -hmm. I think that Jesus is wanting to make a point. He doesn't have a yellow highlighter on the page, but for emphasis, when I'm interpreting the Bible, I say, wow, this is an imp a key word, and it's being repeated over and over again. I'm reading here from the New King James Version, John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. <laughs> By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And this happens to be the verb agapao. We get the noun agape. In other words, the love that God showed that he pours into our hearts. Why does it say it so many times? <laughs> one another. Why does it say it so many times? And why is this passage, Gary, so relevant for us today? <laughs> we need it. Because <laughs> we need it. Yeah. Yeah. What is our natural way of operating? Mm. Selfish. Selfish. Selfishness. And the love of God is? Mm -hmm. Self-sacrificing. Self-sacrificing mm -hmm. love. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I just want to remind you, love as I have loved. By the way, you want to know how to love? Love as Jesus loved. You said, mm -hmm. I can't do that. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's why you need to ask the Holy Spirit to or, 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 or. and love through you as Amen. He pours God's love into your heart. So whenever you see a key word repeated, mm -hmm. just step back and say, wait a minute, there's something really important here. There's an emphasis that the author is trying to make. Okay. Also important when we're interpreting the text is the context. Mm -hmm. I want to give you a ridiculous <laughs> illustration of pulling texts out of context, all right? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask Travis, would yeah. you read for us Acts 20, verse 9, and then Luke 10, the last part of verse 37. You say, my devotional message today <laughs> is taken from Acts 20, verse 9, and Luke 10, verse 37b. And these are my two texts. What, what does it say? And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. And now I'm reading from Luke chapter 10, verse 37, the last part of the verse. And then Jesus said to them, go and do likewise. <laughs> <laughs> now, we read that and we say, that's not, you can't do that. That's pulling a text out of context. context. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. You've created something that's a lie, mm -hmm. something dangerous. Mm -hmm. Fall asleep on a high shelf in church, go and do likewise. That's not what the text is saying. The context of one is a long service before Paul leaves on his missionary journey. Someone falls asleep and God shows his power by raising him from the dead through the mm. Apostle Paul. The context of the other, go and do likewise, is mm, so about a good Samaritan, Samaritan who shows what kind of love? Agape, Agape self-sacrificing love. Mm. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. So, you say, well, Derek, that was such a silly illustration. But sometimes people yeah. say, I'm going to preach a sermon, and I'm going to pull a text from here yeah. and a text from there, and they end up with saying something that's not in the Bible. Yeah, Thomas? I was just going to say that. There's a lot of popular preachers today who will pull like a string of pearls, they'll pull pieces of verses from the Bible and piece it, package it all together. But you're not really learning anything new. You're Actually, you're learning what the preacher thinks is truth but it's not the Bible speaking for itself. Mm. And it's much safer if we allow the passage to be read in its context and to let the Bible speak for itself. So in a, um, in a preaching context, 
the safest is what we would call an expository sermon mm -hmm. where I take one passage and I preach through and share what it's saying. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to preach what we call a thematic sermon, as we do, especially when we're sharing with people who've never heard, what does the Bible teach about salvation? What does it teach about what happens when you die? Mm -hmm. I'm going to choose several passages. But if I'm going to choose them, I've got to make sure that each passage is talking about the yeah. same mm -hmm. theme, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And in order to make sure I'm being faithful, I not only need the text, mm -hmm. I need to look at context. 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 If it's also talking about what happens when you die, or it's talking about how a person is saved, then I can take that because I could say, you know, Jesus talked about salvation when, right? Mm -hmm. yes. I know I'm looking at the context. So let's look at some texts and make sure we understand from the context what they're saying. For example, Genesis 127. We find the word Adam or Adam for the first time. Mm. How is the word used? Well, let's read it. Genesis 1 verse 27. Stephanie? I'll be reading from the King James Version. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Mm. How is the word Adam used in this context? Yeah. Mankind. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. It's not like the proper name of one person. Mm -hmm. right. It's actually the name of Man. two people. Yeah. Male and female. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Male, Male and female. female. Yeah. 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 The human family, or mankind is the word we use mm -hmm. in, in, in English language. We might say the human kind, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? But now I go to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Who will read that for us. Christian, Genesis okay. 2 verse 7. Uh, New King James Version says this, Genesis 2, 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Hmm. Hmm. Who's that talking about? Adam. That was the Adam. male. There it's talking yeah. about an individual. The individual. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. later, God is going to create Eve. woman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. she is given the name Eve. 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 So now it's become a proper name, and it's talking about this specific creation of the male named Adam. Mm -hmm. Same mm -hmm. word, Adam, mm -hmm. but now it's given as a proper name, mm -hmm. and woman, taken out of man, is given another name. Mm -hmm. You see how I've got to look at the context mm -hmm. in order to see what makes sense. Mm -hmm. Let's look at another example of where context is important. John 13 and verse 10. You say, I don't know who wrote this. This doesn't sound... Uh, if your children came and said, I just want to wash this and I'll be ready for bed. <laughs> Haiti, read for us with you John 13 and verse 10. All if right. I'm not looking at the context, <laughs> what does it say? I'll be reading from the New King James Version and it says, Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Mommy, I took a bath last week, oh, tonight, before going to bed after playing out in the meadow. I'm just going to wash my feet. Because Jesus said, <laughs> if you wash your feet, you are completely clean. <laughs> you say, sweetie, you need to read the context. context. So let's look at the context. Uh, we're in John chapter... 13, and we're going to look at verses 3 through 17 as an example of looking at the context. Mm. Who would be willing to read that for us? Have a volunteer? Stephanie? Can read that. And I'll be reading from the King James Version. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet 
and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Hmm. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. <laughs> Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, Ye are not all clean. Hmm. So after he had washed their feet, and had taken his garments, and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent, that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. My Bible says blessed, and makarios in Greek, blessed, to be worth looking at the happy and seeing if it's actually the word blessed that you're blessed if you do them. Mm -hmm. So now, having heard that, the setting is the Last Supper, mm -hmm. the washing of the feet by Jesus, and then saying you ought to wash one another's feet. <coughs> Let's come back to, Mommy, I only need to wash my feet, mm -hmm. and I can go to bed because I'm completely clean. What is that text talking about if I look at the context? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what does it mean if you only wash your feet, you're completely clean? Yes. It's talking about um, baptism. The bath. You've taken mm -hmm. the bath. The bath okay. is as simple as this baptism. And the washing, washing the, the sins feet, away. The washing of the feet is like a mini baptism. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a small, you know, but it's the same symbolism. So it's a reaffirmation of your baptism, mm -hmm. Sabina? Yeah, I also understand that as being the acceptance of Jesus' sacrifice for ah. ourselves. Because he's the one who come as the servant true servant, and as we allow him to wash our feet and to serve us, we are receiving his sacrifice for us. Mm. Mm. And so when I, in this service, kneel to wash someone else's feet, I'm not only showing humility. I grew up, it was called this ordinance of humility. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'm not only showing humility, I'm kneeling by sacred privilege in the place of Jesus mm. and reminding them, hallelujah, I'm getting excited, yeah. that their sins are washed away when they trust yeah. what Jesus has done for them. Yeah. I don't have to be baptized again, right? Yeah. Amen. In order to understand that beautiful promise, that text, I need to do what? Read the context. Read the context. I've got to look at the context. So I'm looking at key words what they mean. I'm looking at times when they're repeated and what the significance of that is. I'm looking at the context, but I also need to look at the whole book mm -hmm. because the whole book is also the context for a text. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we hear many places in the Gospel of John where Jesus says uh, 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 that he wants us to have life, right? Mm -hmm. And then we read in John chapter 20, I'd like to ask someone to read it, John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. That John actually <laughs> tells us, Thomas, could you read it? Sure. John actually tells us, he kind of John helps 15. us. He says, yeah. I just want to tell you the theme of the whole book so that you don't misinterpret anything in the book because everything in the book is related to the theme. Are you with me? Yes. yes. That's the broader what? Context yes. of this text. Sure, this is John um, yeah. 20 verse 30 and or, th and thir or 30 yeah. New King James Version and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book mm -hmm. so it's, it's, verse 31 oh, and, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God and that believing you may have life in his name mm. Mm. 
I used to think John 11 was all about Lazarus. It's not. Mm. It's about Jesus. Mm. What about Jesus? Well, remember what we just read in John chapter 20. What is it about Jesus? Mm. Every life in his name. He is the resurrection and the life. The life. That's what it's all about. John chapter 5, you search the scriptures, you think that in them you have eternal life, but these are they that testify of me, me but you refuse to come to, come me. to me that, that you, you might have life. life. life, and life and you see? Mm. In order to not pull a text out of context, I really need to read the whole book. Mm. Yes. yes. In order to understand what it's saying. And then it comes alive. I see why all through the book he's talking about that we find life in Jesus, mm. right? You need to be born again, new life. Mm. That's what the book is all about. So as I look at different books of the Bible, the last couple of minutes we have remaining, I want you to share with me your favorite book of the Bible and why. Because, you know, each book of the Bible has a theme. Isaiah, the gospel prophet, always pointing to the Messiah, right? That's why I like Isaiah rather than some of the other minor prophets who were talking about how bad they are, even though what they were saying is right. They were bad. Uh, but the theme of Isaiah, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Favorite book of the Bible, anyone, and why? Haiti. I love the book of Acts. The book of Acts. What is it about the book of Acts that really... Uh, there are just so many miracles, and I just see God's power on display in those miracles and in transformed lives. I, I just see power. Mm -hmm. what would you, how would you summarize the book of Acts in one sentence? Holy Spirit. <laughs> Holy Spirit. That's, that's actually just two words, right? Okay. <laughs> Some people have said the book should have been called the Acts of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. yeah. or the work of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit works in the early church. That's a sentence, right? Yeah. <laughs> Just in one sentence. Um, and so as I read each of the stories in the book of Acts, I, I see that theme emerging, and I don't pull something out of context as I'm reading it. All right? Another book, favorite book. Pedro? Oh, my favorite book of Daniel. The, the book of Daniel. Yeah. Why the book of Daniel? Well, because there I found that, uh, that God is in control of everything. And I don't have to worry. It doesn't matter where I, where I am in the world. If I'm in the worst condition in the, uh, in the world, but in the best conditions, God is in control, and He's taking me to to His uh, promise. So even if I might look in Daniel two and see the rock that comes, the kingdom that fills the whole earth, uh, but but if I missed it there in chapter four, it says that they may know that the Most High God rules mm -hmm. in the affairs of men. Mm -hmm. A theme emerges, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, even in the judgment scene in Daniel seven. And in, in the coming of Messiah in Daniel 9 prophesied, the Most High God is sovereign over history. Another favorite book, Thomas. I would say Psalms because, mm -hmm. you know, not all, not all the times are happy times. <laughs> Sometimes you're complaining in the Psalms, right? <laughs> I've, I've been through some hard times and I li read those passages and I totally relate to it. <laughs> but it, paradoxically, it makes me feel better because I know ah. that the Bible understands what I'm going what through. What would you say the theme is of the book of Psalms? Because there's Psalms of praise, there's Psalms of lament, there's mm -hmm. Psalms of uh, adoration. What would you say the theme is? For me, it was God is present through it all. Ah, mm. God is present through the ups and the downs, the goods mm. and the bads. The, the Lord is my shepherd. Mm -hmm. Even when I walk through what valley? The valley of the shadow of death. Mm. Oh, boy, we could have seven more examples of favorite <laughs> books. Maybe I should ask our viewers, write to us, sshope at hopetv.org. Tell us your favorite book and why. sshope at hopetv.org. But you know, studying the Bible is an adventure, isn't it? Yeah. Find those key words, find the repetitions, the significance of those. Look at the context, even the context of the whole book. And it's kind of like uh, being a treasure hunter mm. or a, a miner for gems or for gold, treasure, that God will guide us by His Holy Spirit, not just so we can have more information, but so we can find 
him whom to know is life eternal, mm -hmm. our loving and awesome God. Let's pray together. Mm -hmm. Father, thank you for your word. It is indeed a treasure source. It, it's, it's something that by your Holy Spirit we can understand and we can be blessed as we study your word. Thank you for some simple tools that can help us. May we take advantage of this precious treasure. May your Holy Spirit guide us on our journey. In Jesus' name, mm. amen. 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 In the 1880s, Ellen White visited Oslo, Norway and preached at the Bethel Seventh-day Adventist Church. Today, Oslo is one of Europe's most expensive cities, although it ranks high on quality of life. It's the center of the Norwegian economy and government. The Bethel Church still operates at a prime location in the heart of the city. On Sabbath, you'll find a melting pot of cultures forming Sabbath school classes and then coming together for the main service. In this church, youth are a high priority. In 2017, a portion of your 13th Sabbath offering started a renovation project for a space specifically for youth outreach. The youth group in Oslo is very active and inclusive. Today, Alex and Marielle are asking church members to spread the word about upcoming events to any young person they know. There are universities scattered throughout Oslo with many students hoping to make new friends. This group happily welcomes newcomers into the close-knit community. Events are scheduled throughout the week for the youth to connect with each other outside of church, too. I love the cabin trips that we have. <laughs> Going skiing and hanging out together, because then you get to have like a lot of uh, like deep conversations together, too, with friends that you normally don't get the possibility to uh, in normal settings. I'm a very social being. I need people. <laughs> and. Uh, just a bunch of great guys and girls, good people to hang around with. On this Sabbath, they've planned a picnic in the park after church where they can socialize and get to know each other. For me, I don't always think about it as much as uh, it bring, you know, the youth group, more as uh, yeah, it's my friends, we want to go uh, hang out and then we can just like make, sort of make an arrangement and mm -hmm. get together. Each Sabbath afternoon, the youth group from the Bethel Church joins young Adventists and their friends from all over Oslo for conversation, testimonies, and music. This gives them another opportunity to recharge spiritually and socially. Although this larger community benefits from spending time together, there are many in Oslo who don't know Jesus. The challenges of working in such a large urban area can be discouraging. Norway is a very secular country, so uh, of course it makes it more difficult for mission workers telling people about the gospel because everyone has sort of heard about it and they have in, in a way made their own opinion about it, so it makes it very difficult to show them how good it really is. The young people in Oslo ask Adventists around the world to join them in prayer. We need prayer for trying to have the best kind of environment for people to get more involved with God and each other. So pray for some spiritual guidance, help us to be more or better at meeting people and uh, show others that we are Christians. Please pray for this group in Norway and thank you for your support of the 13th Sabbath offering that is helping this group reach more young people. A warm welcome to each of you as we join once again for our BUC online service. We're grateful for you to tune in and to be a part of this service today. We're glad that we have made it for another week and we give God um, all the glory for his goodness and kindness towards us. We have seen developments in terms of our lockdown this week, um, but our churches still remain closed and we don't know how long that will be for. So um, we just keep going and we pray that as we connect this way, um, we can stay connected to the true vine. And in, uh, during times like this, we can still um, be spiritually um, replenished and encouraged 
as we go through each day and through each week. We have as our speaker today, Pastor Hosey Pete, and Pastor Pete uh, was a pastor right here in the British Union Conference. He pastored in London, in Peterborough, um, various parts of the country, and um, he now resides in Canada and is the assistant to the president for the Ontario Conference. So he will be speaking later on, and we look forward to his message. And so, as we worship together, as we serve God, I invite you, join with me as we sing some hymns and some music together in worship to God.
This is Vitali. He's 10 years old and he lives in a country called Kyrgyzstan. Every Sabbath, boys and girls in Vitali's church are invited to listen to a children's story. After the story, the storyteller always asks, did any of you memorize a Bible verse this week? Any child who memorized a verse gets to recite it for the whole church to hear. For the past year, 10-year-old Vitali has raised his hand and shared a Bible verse every Sabbath. Why do you think he memorizes a Bible verse each week? When a friend asked him, Vitali smiled shyly and said, I memorize verses as a gift to God. You see, the Sabbath school teacher always reminds Vitali and the other children of something important. She says, every day, God gives us many gifts. What gift do you have for God today? God has given Vitali many gifts. He lives with his loving grandparents. He has a home and a warm bed. He goes to a good school. He has food to eat. But Vitali didn't have any money or toys to give his gifts to God. He wondered for a long time, what gift can I give to God? Then Vitali thought about how well he can remember things. He decided to memorize a verse from the Bible every week. His Sabbath school teacher said this would be a wonderful gift for God. He isn't nervous anymore when he stands up in front at church because he does it every week. Vitali is one of six children in Kyrgyzstan who go to church every Sabbath, even though no one else in their families is an Adventist. The children stand outside their homes on Sabbath mornings and wait for the Sabbath school teacher to pick them up in her car. After church, she drives them home. These children like church so much that they go every week no matter what. When it snows a lot and other children stay in their warm homes, Vitali and the others go to church. When the weather is warm and the other children play outside, they still go to church. The pastor is glad that they're so faithful about spending Sabbath with God. In fact, little Vitali loves church so much that he told his older brother about it, and now he goes to church too. Vitali is in the fourth grade at Heritage Christian School in Kyrgyzstan. He loves his school because he gets to learn about God every day. Part of this quarter's 13 Sabbath offerings will help Heritage Christian School. Did you know that the school is named after a Bible verse? Psalm 127.3 says children are a heritage from the Lord. That means children are a special gift that God gives to parents. Please remember Heritage Christian School in your prayers and with your Sabbath School mission offerings.
Good day to everyone. Our scripture reading comes to us this morning from the book of Mark chapter 5. The book of Mark chapter 5. And this morning we are going to be reading from verses 25 to verses 34. The Gospel according to St. Mark chapter 5 and verses 25 to 34. The Bible read thus, and a certain woman which had an issue of blood twelve years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch both his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway, the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude throng in thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And verse 34 and last says, And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. May the Lord add his richest blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Let us, at this moment in time, wherever you are, adapt an attitude of prayer as we will not pray. Our gracious Father and our God in heaven, we are so truly grateful and thankful to you for your many blessings. We thank you for being our God. We thank you for loving us and caring for us. We thank you for the way in which you have kept us and led us through this past week, even though we are journeying through COVID-19. This pandemic, which has literally touched the entire world, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this experience. Because after all, as a union, we had to rethink and relook at how ministry can be done. And so, Father, we thank you for what you have done for us. We thank you for the British Union Conference and the, the leadership of the British Union. We want to also thank you for the various units, the various fields that make up this great union. I pray that you will bless all of us. But more so, Lord, we want to thank you for the near 40,000 members that are in the British Union. And I pray that as we, as a people, journey through this pandemic, that, Holy God, we will take upon ourselves the promise that you had given to us, that you will never leave us nor forsake us, and that you will provide the comfort that is needed for us. We want to thank you also, Lord, 
for those that are working on the front line, those of our key workers that are working. We pray that you will continue to bless them, guide them and keep them. And this week, we celebrated International Nurses Day. And Lord, we want to thank you for our nurses and the sacrifice they continue to make for us as a people. Then Holy Father, we thank you that amidst everything, we as an organization can continue to function. We thank you for the various finances that we have experienced. We ask that Lord, every entity that will, that each entity will continue to function and to serve not just your people, but the community that is around us. Amen. As the deep panted for the water, so my soul longs after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. I'm very happy for the opportunity to be part of the BUC's worship services during this pandemic. Even though I am delivering this message from Ontario Conference's office in Canada, 
my heart remains in the BUC, my natural home. A few years ago, I listened to an interview on CBC radio that left me in deep introspection. It forced me to question my entire attitude towards those who seemed different from those with whom I felt most comfortable. Consequently, I felt compelled to write an editorial about it. I titled it, Welcoming the Others. I'm sharing with you now the opening lines. The doctor said to my mother, you're going to have to do something about that child because I was clearly wrong at birth. This was Brian Brett's account of a life of being different from everyone else, both male and female. And for the first time in my life, I was hearing someone speak about what it is to be born with an unspecified gender. Canadian poet and journalist Brian Brett was born with Kalman's syndrome. It's a hormonal condition that left him biologically androgynous. Until he was 15 years old, his gender was unspecified. He did not experience puberty and had not exhibited any related male hormones before undergoing a series of surgeries to determine maleness. He was essentially born a eunuch. For 50 years, almost 50 years, from age 20, he has been receiving testosterone. Now, growing up in the late 60s and 70s, being ridiculed at school were just natural consequences of him being born different from birth. I could imagine that thoughts of suicide must have been his lifelong companions as he lived as an other. Now, as I listened to the interview, I understood, or rather, I questioned, how would I have related to someone whose experience is so remote from mine? Would I be like so many others and see him as strange? Someone with whom I could not identify. I asked myself, would my fear of the unknown, my insecurities and my prejudices surface? Yes, we all have them. Worse yet, would I attempt to camouflage those responses with a cloak of religion and find Bible passages to point out his failings. In doing so, would it give me the security or sense of well-being that at least I am trying to serve God to the best of my ability and start to feel good about myself? I had to face the truth that I am clearly capable of these things because to my shame, I've done them in the past. They've been my past response to others who are different from me in one way or another. Understand this, my friends. Understand this about our world. Those uh, whom we would normally have placed into the category of others, people who are different from the mainstream, those who do not look like us, those who practice different lifestyles, those whose thoughts, uh, processes, uh, or emotional development occurred different from ours. Those whose physical abilities do not function as how ours do. The Brian Bretts of our world, if you please. Well, they no longer remain in the shadows. We cannot pretend they don't exist. Now, the others have been with us for a long time. They are not new. She was one, and she was born both visible and invisible. The account is written in Mark 5, verses 22 through 34. You may turn to your Bible. Jesus was on his way to heal a young girl on her deathbed when a text introduced her. Remember, one of the others. Verses 22 through 25, and I'll read for you. And the woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. 
she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. Now, the text simply says, and she was there, just part of the crowd. As one of the others, she is not even named. With no name, she does not have an identity, value, or worth to anyone. She is just one of the others, an unknown. Contrast this with the fact that Jairus, the wealthy, influential synagogue ruler, he's named. You see, he was important, so he was known. She was poor, so she was unimportant, living on the very fringes of society, unable to even participate in the ceremonial and social life of the community. I mean, to all intents and purposes, she was invisible, but they both needed the same thing, the healing and the forgiven power of Jesus in their lives. To our shame, we still treat people the same way. Those who have financial means or who are able to entertain us, such as sportsmen and sportswomen, actors and singers, or who are seemingly useful to us, they receive the greatest recognition and all the accolades, even in church, unfortunately. The poor, those with disabilities, and the aged, those who often need our help, we seem to value them far less. But like ourselves, they all need the same thing, the healing and forgiven power of Jesus. Mark introduces her as having suffered for 12 years with a hemorrhage of blood. Now, most probably, her menstrual period and its accompanying uh, crippling pain lasted not just the average three to five days, but the entire 30 to 31 days of every month, year after year. For over half her life, she had suffered. It devastated her physically, emotionally, and financially. Physically, her very life ebbed from her, leaving her feeling weak, lethargic, and in pain. Under a Levitical law, Leviticus 5, verse 25, Whenever a woman had her menstrual cycle, she was considered ceremonially unclean and could not associate with others. So this sickness made her continually unclean. Her social distancing, if you please, was permanent. If she touched anyone or even the clothes being worn, she infected that person making him or her ceremonially unclean for the rest of the day. By law, this nameless woman should not even have been in that crowd. You know, much later in Israel's history, many religious leaders socially distanced themselves from uh, women altogether, avoiding their touch. Instead of, uh, you know, being close, they didn't want to be contaminated by these women. Unfortunately, rather, unfortunately, this kind of misogynistic attitude still prevails in various guises. So this woman was completely marginalized. She was one of the others. As COVID-19 has forced us into temporary isolation, where we cannot hug our family and friends, can you understand not ever being hugged, or seeing your grandchild or baby and wanting to hold that little one in your arms, but prohibited from ever touching the child, much less holding her close. That was her permanent experience, virtually living as a leper, in constant pain, deprived of physical touch, social interaction, emotional satisfaction, and religious association. She could not even look to her church for comfort or support. The text says that she endured much under many physicians, but simply grew worse. She went from doctor to doctor, 
paying for treatment that never worked. She just suffered and grew worse. And this continued for 12 seemingly endless years, leading to complete impoverishment and most probably depression. It is not difficult to imagine her sitting at home, just waiting to die. The doctors were apparently useless. Her neighbors kept their distance, and even her family stayed away. Life had become meaningless. I guess that in moments of depression, suicide must have seemed an attractive option for this woman. What would you have done? This woman could not even call her pastor, the rabbi, to visit her and pray with her because he definitely would not go. This nameless woman had reached her extremities, the last when she heard of Jesus and how he healed people. She heard how he had made the lame walk, the blind able to see, and how he'd even delivered people from demons. She thought if he could do those things, then surely he could give her her life back again. He could heal her. Jesus was her final hope. You know, my friends, isn't this how we are? We only seek Jesus' help when we have, as one writer says, run out of doctors and cash. We don't consider God until all other resources have failed. As long as we have resources to help ourselves, God does not really figure in our lives in any meaningful or significant way. Yes, we sometimes live a life of religion, attend church, even hold an office. But face it, we are just religious, still self-dependent, and we keep God at the periphery of our lives. That is, until our resources are exhausted. Now, the woman had exhausted all her resources. And what she now contemplated was risky. By going into the crowd was a clear violation of the law. And if anyone recognized her, she didn't just risk a 60-pound fine. She risked being stoned to death, but she had done all she could, spent all she had, and now she watches Jesus approach and then push her way through the crowd, coming up behind Jesus. Mark 2, 27 through 28 says, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. She believed that he had more than enough power to heal her. What was her sickness compared to demon possession or having leprosy? Jesus had the requisite power. She just knew it. She believed in his power, not just in the words of his power. He was so filled with power that it just emanated from him. So to just simply touch him or his clothes would be enough for her. However, she also knew that to touch him would infect him and so make him unclean. But I guess she must have reasoned it will only be for a day and he would not be bleeding and in having cramps as she was. Now previously, when she went to the doctors, she went hoping for healing. But reaching out to the hem of his clothes, she was confident that healing would occur. There was no doubt at this point. So she reached out and she touched his cloak. Mark 5, 29 says, immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. As soon as her fingers touched the cloak, she immediately felt something happening in her body. I don't know whether it's a tingling or not, but there was a change. She felt it. The bleeding stopped the very moment her finger made contact with the cloak, and she knew that she was healed. 
Could you imagine the relief and the joy that must have washed over her as she just experienced healing? For the first time in 12 years, she was pain-free. She felt strong, energetic, and healthy. All that was left was to get away quietly without anyone knowing. But fear grips her when she notices that Jesus has stopped and begins looking around. I mean, she had barely touched the hem of his clothes. How could he have felt the touch? Verse 30 says, At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and he asked, Who touched my clothes? Jesus, the source of power, felt power go out from him. It was a large crowd that was following him, and people were all around him. Human contact could not be avoided. But this touch was different from all the others, and Jesus recognized it for what it was. It was the touch of faith. Only the touch of faith is able to connect with the power of God. One writer says that faith had been the lifeline between the woman's sufficiency, between the Lord's sufficiency and the woman's need. As power flowed from him, it was as if life had gone out of, from him to resurrect the life of someone whose next step would have been the grave. Jesus felt that his power had operated on someone. He felt it in his body. Now, it may seem strange that he would turn in the crowd and ask who touched his clothes, but he did not ask because he was angry or indignant. He asked because he felt compassion for this person who was so desperate that she could not bear to trouble him and just to reach out to touch the, his clothes. She knew she had been discovered and began trembling. And so in verse 33, it says, Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. I love verse 34. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Notice, Jesus calls her daughter. Time and time again, we see Jesus doing this. In Mark 2.25, Jesus calls a paralytic son. Now he calls this nameless woman daughter. See, the first thing he does is to restore her identity. She has family. She belongs to someone. She is not alone. She is a daughter of Israel, deserving of respect. But there is more. By calling her daughter, Jesus identifies himself with her. He says, you belong to me. You belong to my family. You're God's precious creation. By this one word, daughter, Jesus heals her shattered emotions. He restores her worth as a person. She belongs to the family of God. Understand that when Jesus calls her daughter, he was declaring that even though she was among the others, unwanted, suffering, without value to society, she belonged to his family. Even though she had been apparently incurable, physically disabled through her bleeding, those things did not define her nor did they diminish her status in God's eyes. She was his daughter regardless. In the same way, the others in our community are not defined by their otherness, nor by their circumstances. The homeless man on the street, the drug addict, the runaway teen, God values them just as he values you and me. Then Jesus adds, your faith has healed you. She needs to know this. It wasn't magic that she was healed. She was healed because she believed in his power. Sure, 
It was an imperfect faith. But she had not gone to him as the Messiah. Jesus helped her to understand. She was healed because she placed her faith in him. Not because she touched his clothes. It was her faith that led her to reach out and touch the clothes. So even while she was one of the others, notice she had faith. Do you see it? A person's disability, his or her gender identification, or sexual identity, those in economic despair, those whose home is on the street, the drug addict, the sex worker, those in prison, and all the others in our society may also be people with faith. They just need to hear that Jesus is passing by. What we understand is that Jesus passes by in you and in me. We are the visible representation of Jesus because he sent us the Holy Spirit to reside in us. Our ministry, my life, your everyday living must therefore be like that of Jesus. Our attitude, according to Paul in Philippians 2, must be like that of Jesus. Just as we minister to the others during and after we emerge from lockdown. You know, we cannot simply return to our church buildings. We cannot just resume our worship services as if it's all there is to being a Christian. Unless our lives touch someone else, especially those in need, the outcasts, the others, we are just occupying space. Now, sin has left its mark on every man, woman, and child. So no matter how highly we regard ourselves or the positions of responsibility we hold in church and in our occupations, we are all among the others because we have all sinned and we have all fallen short of God's glory. Like Jairus and the woman with the issue of blood, we all need the same thing, the healing power of Jesus Christ, his marvelous grace, and his forgiving power. As disciples of Jesus, we are commissioned to serve others, to touch the lives of others in a way that leaves them in a better way than how we found them. We cannot live our lives to ourselves and be content while there is someone who needs a helping hand. And I say to you today, the same Jesus who called the woman daughter also calls you and me by name. John declares in 1 John 3 verse 1 that we are God's sons and daughters, his children. So our commission is to reach out to God's other children, the others, to serve them and to be Jesus to them. Reflecting his compassion, his acceptance, his love, and making an impact on their lives. Many of the others have faith without even realizing it. But they need you and me to pass by as Jesus did. To go where they are, to reach out to them and serve them so they may reach out to Jesus and experience his healing. COVID-19 is forcing all to reflect on how we live and to determine what is truly valuable. You can determine today what you want, that you want to live your life and live a life that's truly worth living because it impacts the lives of others. So after COVID-19, how will you live your life? How will you and your church impact your community? I appeal to you, May 16th, to let this day be remembered as the day when you decided that you want your life to welcome the others in the name of Jesus. I call you, therefore, to make a commitment that you will never be content to live your life for others, for yourself, rather, while others need your help. Whether in a small or a big way, 
So will you make today such a commitment to God? Will you make that commitment? I leave with you the words of Matthew 25, verse 40. And the king will say, I tell the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. May God bless you as you seek to live your life in service to others. Amen. We thank Pastor Pete for that inspiring and challenging message to us today and for our churches. And to be reminded that we serve a God whom in his sight, there are no nobodies. We are all valued and precious in the eyes of God. And he suffered and lived a life which is ours so that we can live a life which is his. And because of that, we have the privilege of being co heirs to the throne of God. We are valuable in his sight and everyone is precious in his sight. And so the challenge for us is to treat other people likewise. So thank you for that message, Pastor Pete. And we just want to take time to recognize um, those who have put forward their prayer requests, those who have gone, gone, are going through challenging times, who have gone through challenging times, bereavement and so forth. We just want to connect each one in prayer. So I invite you to bow your heads as we pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you that you had time to stop en route, to visit someone, to heal them, to pause and to allow this woman to touch the hem of your garment. And you called her by name. You gave her, her an identity. You called her daughter. And we thank you, Lord, that we also have this assurance that we are precious in your sight and we are valuable in your sight and we have our identity in you. And we ask, Lord, that you will allow ourselves to be a vessel of your love, that as you love us, that through the abundance of that love, that we will reach out to love other people and that we will also be a conduit for your, the love of God to flow through us to reach out to other people. So thank you, Father, that we are precious. We pray for your um, protection and your guidance upon those who need your presence right now. And you have said that if we come unto you, all you that labor and are heavy laden, you will give us rest. And that rest is the precious rest that goes beyond anything that is physical, that goes deep to our soul, a mental and emotional rest. So we thank you, Father, for that invitation. We ask that you'll be with those who've made their requests. We ask that you'll be with their needs right now. And bless us as we go through the rest of this Sabbath day and into a new week, an untold week. May you go before us and keep watch and guide us and protect us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So may God be with you throughout this day and through the days to come. Until we meet again next week, we would end by singing that wonderful hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. <laughs>